Hello and welcome to Truck World TV, the UK's only TV show dedicated to commercial vehicles. Yeah, on this week's show we've got a road test of the Volvo FH. We're also looking at the driver's CPC, which is an important thing for 2014. And also we've got an exclusive interview with Beverly Bell, who's the UK Traffic Commissioner, the czar if you like. But now we're going to go from 18 wheels to two wheels. Cycling, it can be great in the gym, not that I'd know anything about that. Great That's on the cool. open road on your mountain bike on the moors, or winding through the country lanes on your racer. Do they still call them racers? Well, they did when I was a lad. Look, penny farthings when you were a lad. Oh, That's cruel, very but cruel. Take cycles and HGVs, mix them together in the inner city, and the results can be disastrous. In fact, the statistics are showing the results can be fatal, and they're on the increase. Yeah, I think it's a really important thing. I think cyclists and trucks in an urban environment have been proven. They're not a good combination, so, but they've got to get on. So when we heard about this uh, course, we thought, yeah, let's have a look at it. That's right, a new scheme by Transport for London, which aims to educate truck drivers and cyclists, get them more aware of each other and have a bit more respect for each other. The Safe Urban Driving Course is the first accredited course of its type in the UK and an extra bonus for drivers is that it counts against those all-important driver CPC hours that need to be completed by September 2014. Here's Andy McCarroll, the Project Officer of the Freight and Fleet Team for Transport for London. The aims of Safe Urban Driving are to make drivers aware of the vulnerable road users in London, especially around cyclists. The other aim of it is behaviour change, and again, behaviour change for the drivers. And one of the things that we're doing with the safe urban driving is we're getting the drivers out of the cabs and onto push bikes to feel the vulnerability that the cyclists feel on a daily basis. Safe urban driving has been run out since 2010, and to date we've trained just over 6,000 drivers. The law. So the format of the, the Safe Urban Driving course, say for instance we've got um, a classroom of 20, we'll break that down into two groups of 10, and the first group of 10 will stay in here with me, we'll go through a PowerPoint presentation covering the theory side of Safer Urban Driving, whilst the other 10 will go on the practical side with the two cycle trainers, and they'll cover the, uh, the practical element of the course, and then we change over. The reaction of drivers is um, a bit of a mixed bag, to be perfectly honest. Um, a lot of the drivers, that, when they start the course, um, they want to learn about new different techniques in driving and things like that. Um, but others are a little bit reluctant, um, especially if they've been driving for a long period of time within the industry. With the drivers getting to grips with the two wheels, Tim caught up with the man putting them through their paces, cycling instructor Paul Cox. How, from a cyclist's point of view, how important do you think this course is really for Central London? Well, obviously, it, it's, it's really important. Um, sadly, the figures speak for themselves, don't they? And the figures haven't been so good recently. Um, how much impact, yeah, bad choice of word, I'm afraid, how much impact they have on, on the situation, we'll, we will see. I mean, I'm out riding a lot. Personally, I find lorry drivers, bus drivers, taxi drivers are the most professional drivers on the road. Personally, I have more problem with car drivers, they're less professional. What do you think comes at one of the main learning points that you want to get across as a cyclist to a truck driver here now? Um, well, there's many, aren't they? I mean, the, the, the left turn is notorious. And you only have to go cycle five minutes to that junction up there to see some infrastructure that's very poor in terms of it puts cyclists in that blind spot on the left um, where they perceive they are safe because they're in their own lane as it were but in fact they're in so much danger of not being spotted because they're on the blind, blind side and then when they cross the junction they are in danger of being cut across by left turning vehicles and it is getting across to drivers that a cyclist who is in a assertive position and very visible is doing it for good reason and that they should appreciate it rather than consider they're being obstructive. That's what I think. Um, and if they come across a cyclist who is riding less assertively and less visibly, that cyclist is probably a weaker, more nervous cyclist who actually needs 
them to be a little bit more careful around that cyclist. So it's an interesting conundrums go on about what they can perceive. It's what they can spot in cyclist habits. For some of these drivers, this was the first time on a bike for 20 years. We wondered how the course was received from their point of view. It's, it's, it's an eye-opener. It, it gets us to see what cyclists are contending with out on the road and things like that. It, it's, you know, we see things from the other side of the coin, basically. Rather than us looking at them that they're parasites on bikes, we look at them that they've got to get to A to B the same as we have. And they've got to you know, use the road the same as we have. I think it's a, a good course, really. I think it's a good thing that we come on this course now. I think it's a good thing for truck drivers so we get to totally understand what it's like to be on a bike and what cyclists do and what they go through when they're on the bikes. Now I'm on, sitting on the bikes, I haven't been on a bike for a very long time. So like being on the bike now and you know looking over my shoulder and all that thing, I realise that these are signs as a as a lorry driver, I'm the lorry driver, I'll be able to notice these things from the cyclists. So it's making me more aware of cyclist behaviour on the roads. Now Tim, you're a truck driver and a cyclist, so which has made you more nervous? Seeing a cyclist when you're in your truck or being on your cycle while the truck comes past? Well, first of all, I'm used to coming back from the pub on the cycle, so... Yeah, not in the thing, truck? No, not, even the, not in the truck, no, no, please, no, definitely not. No, I think the, the important thing, like, take it back to a serious note, is the fact that, yeah, for a truck driver, we've got, we have got blind spots. Oh, there's some legislation coming along that potentially will get rid of that. But the old adage of, if you can't see my mirrors, I can't see you, is always, always the case. For the cyclist side of it, and I don't want to get in this big debate, although, yeah, I am going to go on that big debate. Cyclists, you've got a better chance of seeing what's going on. For us, for truck drivers, especially in the front and round by the side there, in an urban environment, that's a real, and it's been proven to be a cause for disaster. So it's both of them, respecting each other and looking, you know, look for that danger, be one set ahead, be three or four seconds ahead of what's going to happen. Well, let's hope that that scheme by Transport for London goes some way to reducing deaths on London's roads. Now to anyone outside the world of commercial vehicles, the name Beverly Bell might not mean anything. But to anyone who does work in the industry, Mrs Bell will be known as a very important and very influential person. Yeah, she's the traffic commissioner. I mean, just to put it in perspective, those that are not into the truck industry, what we have to do is when we run, go to run a truck, you've got to apply to the traffic commissioner to get a license to run a truck called an operator's license. So Mrs Bell and her team also uh, control this, the licenses. So if she says, yes, you can have a license and you can, and if she says, no, you can't, you can't. But what happens, you might see them along the road, things like the highways agency, the police, despite what people might think, the trucks are very well regulated and they might pull you up. They'll check whether you've got the driver's got the right license. They'll check whether you're overloaded and things like that. Now, if some of these things come to, to light that you're, just, you, you're not doing the right job, then they'll tell the traffic commissioner. And when your license comes up for renewal or even some times earlier then she'll say yes you can have your license or no you can't so literally without the license you cannot operate in the UK so a very important person well recently Mrs Bell was kind enough to grant Truck World TV an interview and Tim went along to meet her thanks first of all Mrs Bell for giving the opportunity to talk to you uh, can you explain what the role of the traffic commissioner is we regulate the commercial vehicle industry, buses, lorries and coaches. We're there to make sure that when lorries are on the road that they're safe and that the drivers who are driving them are also safe. Uh, we also regulate drivers on behalf of the Secretary of State and if they don't act appropriately then they come and see us at a hearing. If operators aren't operating properly then they come and see us at a hearing and we can take action against their licence. In October, you published the revised uh, statutory guidance regarding the operator's licence. What's yes. been the reaction of that? As always, the industry has responded in a positive manner. Those documents are quite legal in their approach, and I think for the first time what they've done is set out a comprehensive review of the sorts of factors that commissioners take into account. What I'm much more interested in is sending a very clear message to the industry and those that use the industry that commissioners are there to regulate in a very practical manner. 
making operators do what's expected of them rather than having very detailed court hearings uh, which can sometimes be a little bit too complex. What are the challenges facing the road transport safety at the moment? How do you feel, do you, how do you think we can improve the safety both from the driver, a driver's point of view and also more importantly the operator's point of view as well? We're currently in a very difficult economic climate and it can be very tempting for some operators to think they can cut corners, either get a little bit more out of the driver or get a little bit more out of their vehicle. We're here working with VOSA to make sure that operators don't cut those corners and to make sure that they're competing fairly. There's a cost to compliance and some operators think that it's cheaper if they don't comply. In fact, that's false economy. Much better to make sure the fleet's in tip-top condition Nothing more um, annoying for an operator than to be stopped by VOSA and parked up at the side of the road. If the vehicles are kept safe, then there's no difficulty and they can deliver uh, their, to their customers on time. How, have, how has your job changed over the years? Is that, uh, has it changed? I'd like to think my job hasn't changed. I'd like to think that my job is very much the same as when I was appointed in 2000. But I think the industry's changed. I think the industry's responded very positively to the work that the traffic commissioners have been doing. We've had our modernising agenda uh, a few years ago and we're looking at doing that again. We're always looking at how we can modernise, how we can regulate more effectively. I think the challenges for the operators are that as we live in a very fast moving society and people expect things now, especially with the advent of the internet that operators have got to make sure that they can get the compliance right so that they can deliver to the customer properly it's literally keeping the wheels of industry turning driver cpc mm. we're a year less than a year away or nine months away with september next year yes what i hear lots of things that we haven't got enough drivers there's going to be chaos happening uh, what's your view and people are saying you're going to put the time back what's what's your view on driver cpc what's happening again okay, there's lots of questions in there yeah of course it won't be chaos british transport industry commercial vehicle industry does a fabulous job in delivering to gbprc there will be some drivers who won't have completed their training those uh, cases may be referred to traffic commissioners and where necessary we can take action um, the message has gone out very clearly very loudly to all operators to invest in driver CPC see it as an opportunity to invest in the drivers who work for you is the date likely to be put back in GB no the dates already been and gone for buses and coaches there's no reason to think that it should change as far as lorries are concerned Time for a quick break now, but when we come back we've got Tim's road test of the new Volvo FH and also we'll be looking at the debate surrounding driver CPC. See you soon. Welcome back to Truck World TV. Now earlier in the series you may have seen my visit to the Volvo factory in Tuve, Sweden, where they make the FH and FM range of trucks. That's very handy because this time we've got the road test on the Volvo FH when we recently visited the Millbrook Test Centre. You can't, you can't write it, can you? What are the chances? I know, exactly. That's it. It's amazing. Just as if it all comes together just like that. Now, it's hard to believe it's almost 20 years since the launch of the previous Volvo FH. It's fair to say it caused quite a stir in 1993, so the new FH has got a lot to live up to. The new FH is all about economy and the marketing for this new truck is pretty much all aimed at saving fuel and increasing uptime rather than focusing on technology and styling cues. And here we are at the business end of the tractor unit. We've got all the weight from the trailer. It's pushed through this fifth wheel and then distributed to the axles and the tyres in this area. Here is a typical Volvo setup where we've got the pusher axle which can be lifted which helps save you on tyre wear more importantly when that weight is transferred here to this axle it can help with the traction as well oh my god things you do for these directors i don't know anyway while we're down here we might as well look at this tyre here now traditionally three axle tractor units you've either gone twin steer or pushers volvo very scandinavian have normally gone for a pusher axle but more interestingly here is they've actually gone for a 385 tyre as well, the super single, and basically it means that's 385 millimetres wide, so anything around the sort of 14, 15 inch, that sort of thing, and it allows for a little bit more weight and also means the fact that you can get a little bit of extra traction when you need it. 
As with most trucks in today's market, there's a wide range of engine and gearbox options on the FH. Starting with a 420 horsepower 13 litre engine, right the way up to the 750 horsepower 16 litre version. Here we are in the Volvo FH, the 13 litre 460 horsepower, and with me I've got a 12 speed automatic gearbox. Um, we're going to go up a few hills, try it out, see what it's going to be like. First impressions are it's very, very responsive. A little bit of a kick towards the uh, when you're needing the power. It seems to fade a little bit up the hills, but you've got to remember it's 460 horsepower. It's not the 500, 600 plus, and 700 plus that you can get in the FH as well. Looking inside the cab, nice bright airy. I know people go on about beige interiors, light interiors, they can get dirty very quickly from a practical point of view. But for me, it's a lot, I always like a lighter car, but inside it lightens you, it lightens you and enlightens the day a little bit. So yeah, like the car, nice and airy. Windscreen wise, quite deep, not as narrow as I find out on the XF, the DAF XF. Uh, and all in all, this is a brand new cab for uh, Volvo, and you can see the research in there. It's nice, bright, airy, but having said that, it is the Globetrotter, it is the top of the range. What more would you expect? As far as the driver's concerned, seating, extremely comfortable, really nice. Not only that, I'm, all right, I'm not a big guy, I must admit, hopefully, in terms of uh, my backside anyway, but I've got at least a couple of inches either side of me, which comforts me a lot, so you feel like you're, you're really in control, and that's an important thing. You're not waddling off the side of the seating. Positioning-wise, you've got electronic rake and brake system, so it means the fact that I can position the steering wheel exactly where I want it, uh, and I like the armrest. I know some people grump about it, it gets in the way, but with nowadays, with modern vehicles, it, yeah, you're right, the old truck's fine because you were messing about with 18 gears, 16 gears, 14 gears, whatever it was. Nowadays, with the modern trucks, you stick it in auto and, to be honest, it's a bit more like an armchair. And this is exactly what I've got, a really comfortable armchair, a leather one as well, and obviously air suspended and all the twiddly bits that you get with it. Uh, nice, very comfortable seating position. And this cab should feel nice, as it's a Globetrotter XL, which is a top of the range. Driving around the twists and hills of Millbrook, you can see this will serve many two-man driver teams well on the millions of miles it will cover throughout its life. We're going to go around steering-wise. I've got a really bad hyping bend ahead of me now at the moment, and the steering is very, very light, very responsive, not too light. That's the important thing for me. I'm going down the hill. There's 44 tonnes pushing me down the hill. I'm now going to put on the engine braking system, and what happens is, the engine slows me down. I've not got my foot on the brake at all, and yet I've got resistance against that, which means the engine is actually slowing me down. The Volvo brake engine is doing that. And that means then I go to the top of the hill, I switch it off, and I continue. It means for a truck operator, the fact that you're not using your brakes at the axle, which can wear out, whereas the engine braking system, you can use at any time. It's a bit of like free braking. The braking might be free, but to get into a new FH off the forecourt, we would expect prices to start at around the £75,000, but as always, in the commercial vehicle world, published figures are hard to pin down. So that's it for our look at the new Volvo FH. Without doubt, a very good truck indeed. As we know, lots of manufacturers are bringing out lots of new trucks this year. But as an indicator of how good it is, it's just been voted International Truck of the Year 2014. Right, moving on to driver CPC, which I'm starting to pick up seems a bit like the offside rule. Um, a bit more complicated. What is it? Yeah, well, what's happened is, first of all, CPC stands for Certificate of Professional Competence, and it basically means that we've got to do 35 hours of training. It's five years, seven hours a time, which is basically one day for five years, and we've got to complete it by September 2014. So, yeah, I know. If you're going to ask me what do I do, I'm sorry, I haven't done. I've done seven hours so far, and that's the problem we've got. I think we've got government looking at it, we've got all the industries looking at it, saying, hey, there's a lot of drivers, and I mean 100,000 plus, that still haven't done all the 35 hours and we're coming towards the end within six months sort of thing so that's the big problem we've got uh, but I think it's a good idea the important thing to remember is and I think some people thought that government would put it back a little bit they're not they're sticking to it and it virtually means the fact that in September if you haven't done your 35 hours you cannot drive your truck that's it they've had five years 
I know, I know, I know, but don't... Oh, that, Doing always, your homework on the bus. Yeah, exactly, that's it. We're always the last minute, mate. Well, we always like to get the views of the drivers here at T-Bay, and we put that whole question of driver CPC to them. Here's what they had to say. I don't see the point in it, really. We all know what we're doing. It's, in my opinion, it's just another making money scheme for whoever's the government but there's no need we all know what we're doing and the digital tachygraphs now and everything else it records everything we're not and we don't need the cpc i think it's just another way of making money personally if i'm going to be honest you spend a lot of money i paid for a license myself uh, i wasn't put through it by mdl so i just think it's a bit rotten it seems to be that you just costing you money all the time to to make make money do away with the cpc because it's not needed because you don't teach you anything you don't already know well, at the moment, I've just done the initial bit, so I've had it easier than a lot of the guys. But, I mean, I've started sort of building up uh, to extend my ticket. Um, so far, i found it all right. Because um, I've done my training alongside my Class 1 training, what I've just done. Um, but, I mean, going off what the instructors have been saying and, and other drivers have been saying, uh, it's quite... It's just, you turn up in a classroom, you learn what you already know. So it's just making sure you haven't really forgotten anything that's basic, really, in my, in my, in my mind. I've done, I think I've got one day to go, and in my view it's a complete waste of time. They're taking you into a classroom to teach you things that are perhaps not of no value. I think the, the first module I did was uh, about healthy eating, which is not much benefit really for when you're out on the road. I think they've had an opportunity, I think it has been a good idea, I think they've had an opportunity to tell us to teach you know, all drivers within the industry something, but I, I've come away personally, I don't think that we've come away with it with anything of value at all. The only value you can get is teaching, you know, on the job, with practical experience. And driving CPC, have you done it? I've done that? it, I've had all done, I'm up, I'm ready, good to go. And what's your view of that? What, is it necessary or what? Uh, I couldn't say it over that. <laughs> with the <a> camera. <laughs> Well, that's it for this week's episode of Truck World TV. But in the unlikely event you can't do without Tim and I for another week, you can always have a look at our website, which is truckworldtv.co.uk. And don't forget, as well as all the news and features, you can have the opportunity to win a Mercedes-Benz driver's jacket this week. See you next time.